didn't hear an amen in the congregation. Was that because everybody fell asleep during the time of prayer? Anyway. <laughs> oh, did you? I didn't hear you this time. Okay. All right. Well, let's, um, let's go ahead and read then uh, the next um, <coughs> portion of Luke's gospel. After the Mount of Transfiguration, when they come back down uh, on the next day, and uh, see the situation that they deal with here, this demon-possessed boy and the disciples' failure to uh, cast this demon out. So uh, I'd like to read Luke 9, verses 37 through 43. I thought I was going to deal through verse 45, but um, actually it, it just, um, it's a different topic. So we'll, we'll connect that to what happens next. Okay, so beginning in verse 37. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation. How long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. May the Lord bless his, his word again to our um, understanding and, and our growth in, in uh, the likeness of Christ of this evening. Now, again, just by way of review this morning, we were looking at the transfiguration and a picture of what it was that Jesus was to receive in his human nature. It would be glorified. He would be exalted. He would be glorified for this work. We saw him praying for this. And remember, all of his prayers were really to advance the work that he had been sent into the world to do, which would end in his glorification. We saw the Father preview that, um, that honor, that glory as Jesus' face uh, and his clothing began to shine in a dazzling white brilliance that basically expressed his character, his holiness, and remember his majesty. And um, we saw why he received that glory or why he was to receive that glory because he would fulfill the whole law and the prophets again represented by Moses and Elijah through the work that he came to do the old the entire old testament was about Jesus about his work what he would do what he would be like and so forth and and Jesus comes and fulfills all the scriptures and so um, again this is why he receives this glory and then we saw, lastly, why it is that, that we should listen to him. And it's because of that glory. It's because of that majesty, because he's been clothed with authority. Remember that majesty is royal power and authority. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all lords. He is our Lord. And that means something. That means that we are to listen to him. We are to honor him by, uh, again, listening and obeying what he says. And we also saw that we should listen because of what our Lord tells us in his word. Uh, he's going to uh, give to us, if we have trusted the Lord Jesus, and if we would follow him, and if we would serve him, what he says he will give us is glory. Actually, not unlike that of our Lord Jesus. Remember when Moses and Elijah appeared to uh, talking with Jesus, that they appeared in glory, which means that they too were shining. They were experiencing the reward that the Lord had for them. Now, the Lord says he will also reward us with a certain measure of glory, and particularly for the work of leading other people to him. Uh, there's a passage in Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3, that appears to be referring to the resurrection and the day of judgment when we stand before him. But this is what we read. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, it appears to be referring to the general resurrection, 
There's a resurrection of, of life and the resurrection of, of death. Jesus says in John chapter 5, there's an hour coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear the voice of the Son of God and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds, the resurrection of life, those who did the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. But then he goes on to say this, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In other words, those who basically understand what it is we should be doing are going to be doing that work and they're going to shine brightly because of the work they've done in leading the many to righteousness. So there's other passages I believe Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, how we're basically going to differ from one another as far as the brightness of, of this uh, shining like stars. And it really is based upon what we do in this world. We will shine with the glory that God in his grace will give us for the work that we have done for him in this life. And so we should pray like our Lord Jesus, right? that the Lord will give us the strength we need to be able to do what he calls us to do, to be his witnesses, which is what we saw this morning, and we should read his word so that we might hear the voice of the Son of God and listen to him, do what he calls us to do, as the Father again told the disciples on that mount. But there is something else that needs to be in this mix, something else that we need if we are to be effective in the work that the Lord has called us to do, and that, as we already have heard, is faith. As we saw in our meditation, how important faith is. We can ask what we want, and the Lord will give it to us. But that faith needs to be a very strong faith. Jesus says, believe and not doubt. The same thing that James tells us in James 1, verses 6 through 8. He is speaking about wisdom. If we lack wisdom, we can ask of God, but this applies to everything we might ask of God. He says this, but he, the one who asks, must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When we ask the Lord, we need to believe. I keep thinking about that example of uh, George Muller in the hold of the ship with the captain, the fog, having them trapped at sea, as it were, and Muller praying and asking the Lord to remove that fog. And then when the captain begins to pray, he says, you don't need to bother because the Lord's already heard my prayer, and basically you don't believe he's going to do it anyway. But I believe he will, and I believe he has. And they go up on top of the deck, and the fog is gone because Muller believed. And that's because the Lord did it. He believed the Lord would do it because he believed the Lord wanted him to be where he was supposed to be. So it has to be in faith without doubting, right? We have to believe. So this evening, what I want us to consider are two things. I want us to consider, first of all, the, the disciples' failure to, to cast out this demon because of their, the weakness of their faith. And then secondly, I want us to see the Lord's success. And this may sound a bit startling, but it was because of a strong faith. We don't often think about Jesus having faith, but he did have faith. As a man, he had faith, and that's how he did what he did. So first of all, let's consider the disciples' failure because of weak faith. Now, Luke tells us that on the next day, Jesus and his three disciples came down from the mountain. Jesus had gained what he was after from prayer. Uh, the disciples had seen what it was they needed to see, and now it was time for them to return to the work that the Father had sent Jesus into the world to do. Now, when they arrived... They saw that the other disciples who were at the base of the mountain had been both successful and unsuccessful in the work that Jesus had called them to do. Now, they weren't just down there, you know, basically sitting on the ground waiting for Jesus to return, but they were preaching and they were teaching and they were ministering, pointing the people to Jesus and likely telling them that Jesus was up on the mountain and he's soon going to arrive. And here's where their success was, because when they came down, there was a large group that had gathered that was eagerly awaiting his return. So that was their success. But there was something in which they obviously had failed. They had not been able to cast a demon out of a demon-possessed boy. Now, 
as we serve the Lord, we do need to remember that we are going to succeed at some things and we are going to fail at, at other things. And that's because none of us are perfect like Jesus. Whatever he did, he succeeded. But we're not going to do that. But we shouldn't let our failures or even the possibility of failing keep us from trying. We should do what we can do for the Lord. But we should also look to the Lord for his blessing to help us do the things that we cannot do. And essentially everything that, that the Lord calls us to do in his work is something we can't do on our own. So we do need to ask for his blessing. Now, since they hadn't been able to help this boy, when Jesus arrived, the boy's father immediately came to Jesus pleading for help. We read in Luke 9, verses 38 through 40. And a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I beg your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. Now, you know, we saw this with the demoniac, remember the one who had the legion. We saw the malice that the demons have towards, towards us as those made in the image of God and their malice towards all of mankind in general. They hate us and they want to destroy us. This unclean spirit would seize this young boy, which essentially means, you know, take hold of him against his will and, and bind him. The boy would scream because of the spirit's assault on him and because of the abuse the spirit would inflict upon him. It would throw him into a convulsion and he would foam at the mouth. Now, you know, some have, have um, seen in this something similar to what some epileptics actually experience, right? They, they fall down and they convulse. I don't know whether they foam at the mouth. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who suffers an epileptic seizure is necessarily demon-possessed. But this one certainly was. And as the spirit would leave, apparently it would come and go. By the way, I should also mention this spirit also left him, I think, mute and deaf. It would maul him. You know, maul is, is a term that means to beat and to bruise. So it basically would beat him up and leave him in a bruised condition. Now Mark also records that the spirit would throw this young boy into the fire and into the water, trying to destroy him. That's what the Spirit was doing to him. Now, if you've ever wondered what basically the devil and his demons would do to us if the Lord wasn't standing in his way, this is really an example of that. The Spirit would have destroyed this boy. The only thing standing in his way was the Lord. Now, Put yourself in the father's position as a, as a parent, and if you, you've never been a parent, then just imagine what this might be like. If this was your child, if this was your son, and you saw him going through this, and there was absolutely nothing that you could do to help him, and there was no help you could find from anyone around you, but you knew that Jesus was the only one who could help, and Jesus is present, I mean, what would you do? Well, you'd probably do the same thing that this man did. You would do everything you could to get Jesus attention. Now, if we want something badly enough, especially for someone that we love, then we will do whatever we need to do in order to get it. Now, think about if, if we had that kind of love for the lost, even, even our lost loved ones, if we really love them the way our Lord calls us to love them as ourselves then wouldn't we do everything we could to reach out to them, to get them to look to Jesus? Now, this is the reason why we need the Spirit of God. This is the reason why we need more of the, 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 the Spirit's love that He gives to us is because we don't have the love we need to reach them. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons toward, towards the end here. But I want you to notice, secondly here, what Jesus says is the problem, why this boy was in the condition that he was, why he was demon-possessed, why his father was helpless to do anything about it, why, I believe, also, Jesus was saying the disciples weren't able to cast this demon out. And certainly we're going to see that it is um, a problem they also were experiencing, and, and also in a few moments. But it's what Jesus says in verse 41. 
Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? You know, we think about um, how Lot suffered when he was among the people of Sodom uh, because he was righteous and they were evil. Uh, think about how Jesus suffered every day that he was in this world with all the unbelief and the perversity that was around him. Well, this was the problem, and this is the reason why the child was in the condition that he was in. Now, the first problem was that of unbelief. They didn't have faith. Now, who didn't have faith? Well, Israel didn't have faith. They were in darkness in the land of the shadow of death when Jesus, as it were, like a light dawned upon them. If Israel had believed, if they had faith, then basically the Lord would have blessed their land. He would have removed all the evil spirits from their borders and not allow it to be overrun with the demons that were then present. If this man had believed, if he had been faithful to the Lord and walking in his ways, he would much more likely have been enjoying the Lord's blessings rather than being in the terrible situation that, that he's in. Now, we do need to recognize that our faithfulness doesn't always necessarily guarantee that our lives are going to be easy lives. As a matter of fact, the Lord tells us that we're going to have to endure tribulation in this life. And it certainly doesn't mean that God's blessing will always be on our children, but it does mean that it's more likely to be the case. And I think this man, if he had faith, would certainly have known what to do about this situation. Um, turn to the Lord in faith. Turn to the Lord in prayer. If this boy had believed, he wouldn't be in the situation that he was in. He wouldn't be possessed. Now, we don't know exactly how old he is. We do know that he had suffered from childhood. We do know that because of he's called his, his son and he's called a boy, um, that he likely had not yet reached puberty and gone through his bar mitzvah, you know. But he does appear to be old enough to believe. Sometimes children can believe at a very early age. If he had believed, he wouldn't be in this situation. If the disciples had believed, they would have been able to cast this demon out. But for some reason, their faith wasn't strong enough. Jesus basically says as much in Matthew 17 verses 19 through 20 in, in a, a parallel passage. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, this is after the demon had been cast out, and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Now, we do know that in other places, Jesus said, this type doesn't come out except by prayer. In another place, in, in uh, brackets, because the reading is uncertain in the manuscripts, this, time, this type doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. What was Jesus talking about? Probably prayer and fasting for a greater faith to be able to do what it is they weren't able to do. The real problem was their, their faith simply wasn't strong enough. They were weak in faith. They didn't believe. They didn't believe that God would do this through them, okay? So Jesus said, first of all, unbelieving. Secondly, he said, perverse, okay? Now, perverse can have certain connotations, and he's not saying necessarily, you know, sexually perverse, although it might be included in that, but he's talking about perverse in general. Perverse means to distort or to twist God's truth, these people had turned away from God's truth. They had distorted His truth, and they weren't walking in it any longer. This is what Jesus found everywhere in Israel, where there's a lack of faith. There's also going to be a lack of walking in God's ways and listening to His voice and following Him. And that's why Jesus said, uh, you know, how long will I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Uh, basically, He had to exercise so much patience and forbearance, long-suffering everywhere he went because everywhere he went, he saw unbelief and this perversity. Now, obviously, this is what we find around us as well. And if we don't see it, we need to get into the Word of God more. There's a lot of it around us. And that's why we need also patience like our Lord Jesus because we're like Lot living in Sodom. I remember when... Um, and this was years ago, Billy Graham said this, and things have gotten much worse since that time. 
He says, if the Lord doesn't destroy America, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, so we need to think about that. We need patience. We need forbearance. You know, we need to be able to endure what's going on around us as we do the work of the Lord, even as our Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, another thing is we often find these same things within ourselves. And we need to know how to deal with them. Unbelief and, and this perversity. Otherwise, we're going to be as helpless as the disciples. So we need to know how to overcome this. The problem that they had was not unique to them. You know, we have the same problem. So secondly, let's take a look at our Lord's success because of the strong faith, because this is what we need. Now, again, we don't often think about Jesus as having or even needing faith. But we do need to remember that, that he was fully human. If we think about the man Christ Jesus as basically God somehow squeezed into a human body with all of his attributes, then we're thinking wrongly about Jesus. He was fully man. Everything that he did, he did by faith. And let's not forget what faith is. Faith is not, gosh, I hope this happens. I hope the Lord comes through. I, I, I hope that these things turn out to be true. That's doubt. That's not faith. Okay? Faith is the belief that God certainly will come through in everything that he had promised. And we know that that's the way that Jesus lived. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Jesus had a perfect faith, a faith that works by love, and I think we see that love very strongly, a faith that, that didn't doubt, but that trusted everything that his father said was true, trusted in the faithfulness of his father. He had this faith and this love by the Holy Spirit in the same way that we have, only he had a perfect faith, okay? His is the perfect example of faith. Now, Jesus told the man to bring his son. And while he was coming, the demon slammed the boy again to the ground, threw him into a convulsion, again trying to destroy him or to keep him from coming to Jesus. But we read in Mark's gospel this, in verse, chapter 9, verses 25 through 26, when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And they became, the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But then Jesus reached down and he, he basically raised him up and he was okay. And he gave him back to his, his father. He was delivered. Now when the crowds saw this, they were all amazed at the greatness of God. They were amazed. They were amazed that this actually took place. But the thing is, if they had had faith, they, they really shouldn't have been amazed because faith takes, takes the, kind of like the, the surprise, as it were, out of it. If they had believed, then they wouldn't have been really so much amazed because they would have expected that that's exactly what would have happened. And they would have praised the Lord for his mercy. So here we see the power of faith. Remember, Jesus says, with faith, nothing is impossible. And Jesus exercised that kind of faith and did the impossible. And Jesus basically told his disciples, you could have done this if you had only believed, which is what they should have done. Now, we need to ask the question, where are we going to find the strength to be able to do what our Lord calls us to do, right? Where are we going to find the strength to be able to live as Jesus and to be able to tell others about Jesus when we don't find that strength within ourselves, okay? Well, we're only going to find it where our Lord found it, and that is, of course, in God. And in our case, we find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way we're going to receive it from him is by faith. We have to trust that when he says he's going to give it to us, he will give it to us. Now, I would say that there's likely many reasons why we struggle to reach out to the people around us more than we do. And I can, you know, the one thing the Puritans said is that to, to be um, effective at communicating God's truth, to be effective as, as a preacher, you need to know two things. You need to know the Word of God and you need to know your own heart because you're going to find lots of examples in here. So where are all these examples come from? Well, from 
my own struggles, right? We all have struggles to reach out to others. And as I thought about what are the things that get in the way, well, here's a list, and perhaps we can add to some others. Uh, perhaps it's because we don't believe strongly enough that our neighbors are really in the danger that God says that they are in, that we don't believe what the Bible says is true. Now, you know what? We, there are probably times when we do believe and there are probably times when we don't believe as strongly. And I, I'll wager to say the times we don't believe it as strongly are the times when the opportunities are beginning to present themselves to speak to these people. Because that's when the spiritual warfare begins, when our flesh attacks and the enemy attacks. Now, if that is the case, how do we overcome that? We need more faith. We need to believe that what the Bible says is true. We need to believe that what it says is going to happen to those who die in their sins, that that's really going to happen, right? So we need to believe. We need to have a stronger faith. Now, maybe we believe what the Bible says, but quite frankly, we're not that concerned about our neighbors. Maybe enough to reach out to them, okay? Now, if that's the case, then we need more faith, <laughs> Because, remember, the faith and love are, are basically intertwined, aren't they? Uh, Paul says in Galatians 5, 6 that the faith that the Lord gives to us is a faith that works by love. The stronger our faith, the stronger our love. The more faith we have, the more we're going to be concerned about our neighbors. So we need more faith so that we'll be concerned about them, so that we'll love them as we love ourselves, so that we will actually reach out to them. Uh, perhaps we're afraid that we won't be able you know, to explain the gospel well enough that they won't believe us. Maybe because we don't look like we believe it or maybe we're not convincing enough. Maybe our, our belief is that somebody else can do it better than we can. So if that's the case, we'll let somebody else do it. Now, if that's the case, we need more faith. <laughs> we need to believe that God will give us the ability and that he will work through us to do what he has actually called us to to do. Maybe we're afraid of what they're going to think about us, okay? how they're going to treat us if we share the gospel with them. And I think we're all likely facing this fear in light of today's climate, political, social climate. If that's the case, we need more faith. We need to believe that the Lord will protect us. We need to believe that even if the Lord allows us to suffer, and by the way, does the Lord ever allow his people to suffer for the work of the gospel? Did Paul ever suffer? Did the disciples ever suffer? And that was among the people who believe the Bible, right? Uh, at least supposedly, the Jews. What about in a world like ours, okay? Well, we need to believe that if the Lord should allow us to suffer for doing it, that he will give us the grace to endure it and that it will be worth it. Okay, for the reward that he will give us in the end. Now, here's another big one. Maybe we're afraid of losing friendships. You know, if you tell a friend, even a family member, an acquaintance, that they've offended God and that they're in danger of judgment because you have to communicate that at some level, don't you? I mean, they need to know why they need a Savior. You can't just say, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Right? Jonathan Edwards pointed out that the doctrine of hell was much more effective in waking people up to their need than the doctrine of God's love in heaven because they really didn't see that that, that was desirable, but hell was something that they knew they wanted to avoid. They need to understand their need for Jesus, and if we tell them that, it, it might actually divide us from them. It might end that relationship, and I think... You know, we, do, we don't want to see those relationships end. But again, if that's the case, we need more faith. We need to believe that rescuing them, the possibility of rescuing them is worth risking that relationship with them. I mean, would you rather keep them as your friend as you both go to the end of your lives, die, and that person ends up in hell and you end up in heaven, you know? Um, or would you rather risk separating from that friend in the hopes that this person might come to faith in the Lord Jesus, in which case they'll become closer than a friend. They'll become a member of the same family. Well, whatever the reason is, I think you, you can see we need more faith. We need faith to overcome all these difficulties. We need the faith that works by love so that we will want to do 
this work because we love the Lord and want to honor him and because we love our neighbor and are concerned about their well-being. So then lastly, how can we have this stronger faith? We need faith that works by love. How are we going to have more of this? Well, we can only have it through the Spirit's ministry, right? The Spirit is the one who, who creates the faith. He's the one who strengthens the faith. We need more of the Spirit's ministry. In essence, what we need is what the Apostle Paul commands the Ephesians, and of course, us as well, that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, how can we be filled with the Spirit? Well, a couple of things we need to do. We need to pray. Remember how James tells us in James 4.2, you do not have because you do not ask, right? So we need to ask. And, of course, we need to ask without doubting. We need to ask faith. But secondly, we need to keep from grieving the Spirit. Remember the, the two things that Jesus said was the cause of this child's predicament? Unbelieving and perverse. Okay? We need to have faith. We need a stronger faith. For that, we need more of the Holy Spirit. But we also <clears throat> need to stop grieving the Holy Spirit by twisting or perverting the ways of the Lord. You know, by going off in some direction. Whenever we sin... We offend the Spirit and we grieve the Spirit, we weaken faith, we weaken love, we lose everything we, we want to gain in order to do what the Lord calls us to do. <clears throat> so we need to pray, but we also need to submit to the Spirit of God as He leads us in the Word of God and stop twisting the direction of the Lord. Remember what Bunyan said in Pilgrim's Progress, the ways of the Lord are straight as a rule can make them. Not twisted, not turning, but straight and straight in the sense of being absolutely right, good, and righteous and holy. So again, the more we have of the, of the Spirit's ministry, the stronger our faith is going to be and the stronger our love. And one other thing I think <clears throat> would also be helpful in this, and that is we, we need to see that, that we really can't go from square one <clears throat> to square 100 in, in one jump, right? So I don't think we're going to tonight be like the captain of the ship in the case of, of George Muller, uh, who really didn't believe God's going to do this, and then tomorrow we're going to come out like George Muller, believing that God can do this. The reason why George Muller believed that God would do that is because he had seen the Lord answer prayers throughout his entire life in ministry, moving from the lesser to the greater, so I think what we need to do is begin to look to the Father for small things in faith, and when we see Him provide these things, uh, our faith will strengthen to be able to ask Him for the greater things. So begin small, and when you see the Lord's faithfulness and your trust builds, begin asking for greater things. And really, there's no ceiling to this, okay? The only thing that limits what we can receive from the Lord is our faith. So we need to ask, we need to believe, and we need to obey. And again, um, uh, starting small and going larger, uh, we need to make sure that um, we look to the Lord for everything and acknowledge when He answers and know that He is faithful. Well, may the Lord help us to do this. If we are able by His grace, we will be able to do much more for Him than we are currently doing. All right, well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us.